Hello and welcome back to this series of videos on corpus linguistics. In the last video, we talked about some fields that use corpora in order to study language phenomena. And one of these fields is sociolinguistics. Now, we didn't really give much detail when we were talking about sociolinguistics and corpus linguistics, rather we covered uh, things in a general manner. So that is why today we give a bit more detail and see how we can do things to study sociolinguistic phenomena using corpora. Right. This video will be divided into two parts. So for the first part, we'll see how one language is used in two different geographical locations. And for the second part of the video, we'll see how one language item or feature is used either similarly or differently between male and female speakers. Okay, so that was jump right into it. For the first part of the video, I'll be using this website. If you want to visit it as well, to follow along in the video, please feel free to do that. And more specifically, I'll be using this corpus, the global web-based English corpus. As you can see, the corpus is made of approximately 2 billion words. The data is taken from 20 different countries. Uh, the time period is between 2012 and 2013. And the genre, or the text that's made the corpus, are taken from the web on, from blogs. Okay, so if you click on the corpus, you get the following interface. And let us start our analysis. So, if you click here on sections, you'll get a list of countries. So select two countries that you are interested in or curious about. Uh, for myself, I chose Australia and Ireland, and I'll see how English is used either similarly or differently in Australia and in Ireland. Uh, right, for this video, I thought it might be interesting to see the most frequently used adjectives in Australian English and Irish English and see if we can spot some similarities and differences. So to do that, click on post here, that is part of speech, you get the following list and select adjective all. And that will give you the list of all the adjectives uh, that are used in the Australian and Irish corpus. Uh, I chose to sort the data or the frequencies by frequency so that I can have a look at the most frequently used adjective in each corpus. If you want to do that, you'll get the following. Now, you notice that you have two tables here, one table to the left and one to the right. The table to the left contains the most frequently used adjectives in the Australian corpus, and the one to the right contains the most frequently used adjectives in the Irish corpus. And here, there are a lot of things to interpret. So, let us start. You would notice here that you have tokens 1 and tokens 2. So, Tokens 1 refer to the number of times each adjective is used in the Australian corpus, right? And tokens 2 refer to the number of times each adjective is used in the Irish corpus. Okay, and notice here that they are reversed. So here you have tokens 2. There is the number of times the adjective has been used in the, in the Irish corpus, right? And tokens 1 refer to the Australian corpus, right? So by looking at these numbers, you might be interested uh, in comparing the frequencies across both corpora. So for instance, you might notice here that the adjective other is used in the Australian corpus more than in the Irish corpus. So you might be tempted to say that, well, it seems that Australian English uh, uses the adjective other more than Irish English. Well, not so fast, because as you notice here, corpora are not of the same size. So the Australian corpus is larger than the Irish corpus. So it doesn't make sense really to compare the raw frequencies and come up with uh, any sort of interpretation. What you need to do in case you're working with corpora of different sizes is to normalize the frequencies. How can I do that, you ask? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, to do that, you need to uh, use this formula. So as you can see, since uh, the corpora that we are using are made of more than million words, then we need to come to normalize per million words. And the formula is the following. So you divide the raw frequency, that is the frequency that you find here, by the corpus size, the one that you find here. And you multiply it per million, because remember, we're, we're normalizing per million words. And that gives you the following results. So this is what PM1 and PM2 stand for. So PM1, PM1 is the normalized frequencies per million words of tokens 1, and, well, you guess the rest. 
And here you can notice one interesting thing. Have a look here at the adjective new. You notice that the adjective new is actually used more frequently in the Australian corpus. But if you look at the normalized frequencies, it seems that it's the opposite. It is used in the Irish corpus more than in the Australian corpus. So this is the bottom line. If you're working with copra of different sizes, don't rush and uh, compare raw frequencies. Always go for normalized frequencies. And if you're working with corpora that are less than a million words, say between 10 to 90,000 words, then it doesn't really make sense to normalize per million words. What you need to do is to normalize per 10,000 words. How can I do that? Well, all what would change is this one. So instead of multiplying per million words, we'd multiply per 10,000 because remember, you're normalizing per 10,000 words. Okay? So let's uh, see other things that you can interpret from the following results. Uh, what else? Right. You'll notice that some adjectives are uh, highlighted, for instance, Australian and Irish, and some of them are not. The adjectives that are not highlighted have similar frequencies across both corpora. For instance, look at the adjective other or good or new. You'll see that their normalized frequencies are almost identical. So, in terms of frequencies, there isn't really anything to, to contrast because they share similar frequencies. The ones that are highlighted are more relevant, and by relevant, I mean that they are used in one corpus more than the other. So, for example, the adjective Australian is more frequently used in the Australian corpus than in the Irish corpus. And the same goes for Irish. It is more frequently used in the Irish corpus than in the Australian corpus. What a shock! <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Uh, so, if you are not interested in relevance, if you are interested in similarities, then go for the adjectives or the items that are not highlighted. And here I'd like to, I'd like to draw attention to something. Just because they have similar frequencies, it doesn't mean that they are used uh, similarly. So though they share similar frequencies, you cannot jump ahead and claim that the adjective is used similarly in Australian English and in Irish English. In this case, you'd need to look at the extended context, that is the concordance lines, to get an idea of how the adjectives are actually used in context. Right? So, numbers alone are not really sufficient to make any sort of interpretations in case you're interested in similarities of use. Uh, as for relevance, if you're not really interested in similarities, you're interested in relevance, then you'd need to change the source in here from frequency to relevance, and you'll get the list of the most relevant adjectives in each corpus. And here, again, there are a lot of interesting things to notice. For instance, you notice that the adjective resolved does not occur at all in the Irish corpus. The same thing for Gansky, uh, non-parole, etc. So, here you might ask some question. For instance, why is it that the word resolved, or the adjective resolved, does not occur in the Irish corpus? Is it because they have another term that means a similar concept? Uh, does it mean that, well, it didn't uh, come up in the corpus simply because it didn't uh, come up in the topics that were discussed in the data that uh, makes the corpus? So, as I've said, the numbers are there, but any sort of interpretation is up to you, the researcher. You'd notice also other things. For instance, in the Irish list, you see that the most relevant adjectives are also used in the, in the Australian corpus. So, you don't find things like this, that is, adjectives that are exclusive to one corpus. And that might strike your interest. And to get an idea of why certain adjectives seem to be used in both corpora, then simply click on the number of the adjective, that is, uh, you click here on the tokens one column to see how the word Irish is actually used in the Australian corpus. And that might give you an idea of why the adjective is found in both corpora, even though uh, it is one of the most relevant adjectives. So, to do that, uh, if you do that, sorry, you'll get the following results. And here you might get an idea of how the adjective is actually used in context 
So for instance, here you have I'm part Irish, part English, and so on. Here again you have my ancestors are still Irish, and well, that gives you an idea of why the adjective Irish is found also in the Australian corpus. Now as I've said, the numbers are there, but numbers alone are not sufficient to make any sort of claims. You need to analyze the data a bit further to come up with any sort of interpretations uh, relevant to the, to the field of sociolinguistics. Okay, so this is it for the first part of the, uh, the video, quick recapitulation. If you want to compare frequencies and corpora are of different sizes, please don't forget to normalize the data in case the software or the website in this case does not provide you with normalized frequencies. And if the corpora are made of more than a million words, normalize per million words. If the corpora are made of, say, tens, tens of thousands of words, then normalize per 10,000 words and so on. And don't, uh, don't rely on numbers and frequencies alone. They're usually not really, re uh, not really insightful. Uh, do a bit more analysis and uh, look at the concordance lines, the collocations and so on to get a better understanding of how things are used in context and authentically. Remember? Right, now let's move to the second part of the video in which we see how certain linguistic item or feature is used either similarly or differently between two uh, types of speakers, that is male and female speakers. To do that, we'll visit uh, the BNC64. Uh, as you can see, it is taken or extracted from the BNC demographic. The corpus is made of approximately one and a half million words. And the speakers that uh, provide the data for the corpus are 32 men and 32 women. And as you can see, the sample size for individual speakers is between 6,000 words approximately and 64,000 words. So again, here it doesn't make sense to normalize per million words. You'd need to normalize per 10,000 words. Right. So if you visit this website, link is in the description down below, you'll get the following interface. And here in the search box, you could either search for words, for instance, sorry, you could search for phrases, uh, idiomatic expressions, sentences, and so on and so forth. For this example, I chose the word sorry, and let's see uh, which type of speaker uses the word sorry more. Is it men? Is it women? Let's find out. So, if you type in that and hit enter, you'll get the following results. So here, you have normalized frequencies and absolute frequencies. And the same thing here. So this. This is uh, the data for male speakers and here for female speakers. You'll notice that men use the word sorry 249 times and women use it 359 times. But if you compare the normalized frequencies, it seems that the score for male speakers is slightly higher than the score for female speakers. So you might jump ahead and say that, well, it seems that men use the word sorry more than women. Well, here, I'd like to draw your attention to something else. Uh, normally, when you compare frequencies, it's almost impossible to find the exact same numbers. The difference is always there. The question is, is that difference statistically significant, or is it just the result of chance? So, to get an answer, you need to look here at the statistical tests. So, these tests tell you whether the difference is in this statistically significant or is it just due to chance? And as you can see here, you have no for both statistical tests. That means the difference, though it is observed, it is not really significant, it's just a matter of chance. Okay? As I've said, do not always rely on numbers. You need to do more analysis to properly interpret the data. Now, let's say that you have another question in mind when searching for the word sorry and say that you want to see which type of speaker apologizes the most using the word sorry. Now, as you know, just because uh, somebody says the word sorry, it does not really mean that they're apologizing. And if you want to uh, investigate which type of speaker apologizes the most using the word sorry, you need to look at the extended context, that is, the concordance lines. And to do that, for instance, say that you have a suspicion either that female speakers apologize more or less, then click here on female, right? And you get the concordance lines 
of the word sorry. And as you can see, some of them are really apologetic. For instance, I am sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I am really sorry, etc. But if you uh, look carefully at the data, you see that a lot of instances are not really uh, examples of apologizing. For instance, my dad's like, I'm sorry. He looked really sorry. You said sorry. Where is this sorry? Uh, do you feel sorry? Right? So, by the way, I'm not attempting a British accent. <laughs> I'm horrible at that. Uh, anyway, as you can see, not all examples are uh, instances or cases of women actually apologizing. So, remember, don't rely on frequencies alone. Always do more analysis. Okay? Now, let's give another example. Let's see how or which speaker uses the word darling most. Is it men? Is it women? Let's find out. So by typing the word darling in the search box, you'll get the following results. And here you'll notice that by comparing absolute and normalized frequencies, it is evident that male speakers use the word darling less than female speakers. And if the, that does not convince you, you can look at the statistical tests and you'll see that yes, the difference is actually significant and it's not due to chance, okay? As I've said, these numbers might be meaningless. You might, do, you might want to do more analysis. And this is what these tables are useful for. Here you have M1, M2, M3, etc. And these are individual speakers. And if you look here in the, in the table of female speakers, you see that one female speaker actually uses the most down in the most right and you might say that well it's because of this speaker here that uh, we notice that the difference is actually significant and may, perhaps if that speaker was not in the list uh, the difference might not be significant to this i'll say well maybe you're right but again maybe you're not you cannot really modify the data to right to uh, serve your purposes so you need to interpret the data as it is and you might notice also another thing. Although this female speaker uses the most darling more than other female speakers, you could notice that most ladies here use the word darling uh, in, the, in the corpus. Unlike in the male section, you see that a lot of men do not really use the word darling. So bottom line is, don't rely on the numbers alone. Always go for further analysis to properly interpret the data and well this is an idea or an example of how you can compare one language feature or item phrase etc across different uh, types of speakers different uh, genders different geogra geographical locations right different uh, religious backgrounds and so on and so forth right so obviously the field of sociolinguistics is much much richer and much more complex than this but i'm giving you examples to uh, I don't know, inspire you maybe, just give you ideas of things that you can do using corpora in order to study sociolinguistic phenomena. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the video. If you have any questions, any comments, as always, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. If you want to reach out to me, the email is in the description. And uh, yeah, as always, thank you for watching. Uh, stay safe, take care, and see you in the next video. Bye-bye, ciao, ciao.